Um, I I am Sandra Alexander. I work at the Division of Violence Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in our child maltreatment work. And uh, I'm also pleased to be on the advisory board for Prevent Child Abuse Georgia. So um, we were all excited in Georgia when we heard that Mark was coming to Georgia State. And you heard this morning that he has recently joined um, Georgia State University as a professor of health promotion and behavior in the School of Public Health. And Mark brings with him a long history. Um, he's not as old as me, I don't think, but he has a long history. <laughs> a long history um, of experience and expertise and research uh, that is very important to the work that we do. And I and many of my colleagues have over the years often gone to Mark for guidance, ask him to review things, and certainly used his research to help inform our work. And I know you have his bio, uh, but I'm gonna just take some time to read some of it anyway, because I think it's important to know the real uh, breadth of the work that he's done and is involved with. Um, Mark was an associate professor of pediatrics and a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And he has also been a member of the APSAC, American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children Board of Directors in the past. And he has published many, in many journals in the field, including the APSAC Handbook on Child Maltreatment. His main areas of interest and research focus on child abuse and neglect, um, in addition to child abuse and neglect, include delinquency, intervention and service systems, particularly the development and implementation of evidence-based prevention and treatment approaches with public sector service systems. His research has been supported by the National Institutes for Health and also the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where I work. Some of his current studies include testing new treatments for preventing child maltreatment, recidivism among families in the child and family service system, examining different approaches to implementing models in large statewide children's service systems, testing interventions designed to reduce delinquent behavior, and studying long-term um, service outcomes. Mark has also served as the editor-in-chief of the scientific journal Child Maltreatment and is a fellow of the American Psychological Association in addition to his research work um, he has been actively involved in delivering clinical services and clinical supervision um, while in Oklahoma. One of the things that I think I like about Mark is that he's a broad thinker. He has the ability to communicate information in a way that makes sense. I'm not a researcher or a scientist, and so it's really helpful to have things laid out in a way that I can understand and use. He, I think, has done a lot to push the field forward in many different ways. And he tells it like it is. And I think he, he challenges us to look at our own thinking and maybe to think differently um, about things that we maybe would not have um, in ordinarily. So I think we're very fortunate to have Mark here in Georgia and to have him as the keynote speaker here today. And I know we're all excited to learn what we know and what we don't know about prevention, and I'm going to be taking notes. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, and welcome to Georgia. Thank you, Sandra. I, I've known Sandra since God was a boy. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so it's, I'm, I'm betting I'm older than you. And, uh, but, but both of us go back in this field a number of years. So, so when I agreed to do this, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll have some PowerPoint slides with some charts and graphs and numbers and statistical models. And, and, and Jill said, you're talking at lunch, just talk about whatever your experience is. So, and I thought, well, what's my, you know, really what's my experience in this field? And, and I think, like you alluded to, you know, a lot of it is institutional memory uh, about, about where we've been, 
maybe where we are now. Um, I, I started out as a direct service provider and uh, continue to do that until July of this year. So, and, and then moved into research, and I've been primarily a researcher for, I guess, about the last 25 years in this area. And, and so now I'm a researcher and a teacher, which is going to be a new thing at Georgia State. Um, and, and so I've begun thinking about, you know, what to talk about for those of you who maybe aren't 35-year veterans in this field. Well, some of you probably are. Kind of a little bit about, uh, about where we've been in child abuse and neglect, a little bit about where we are now, and, and maybe some ideas about how our current evidence-based research, which has been burgeoning in this area, how this might suggest some new directions that we could be going. So, so a little bit about where we've been <coughs> and where we are. And uh, um, I think despite what our advocacy habits have been, which is that things are horrible and they're getting worse by the day, so give us more money and support because it's really important what we do. This has been our advocacy narrative. Unfortunately, it hasn't squared with the facts for you know at least 20 years now. Um, and, and the good news is that currently we are enjoying probably the lowest rates of physical and sexual abuse of children in the modern era. These have been dropping and dropping by a lot for about 25 years now, since the, since the early 1990s. And we're talking about drops on the order of 50 or 60 percent or more in physical or sex. And, and these parallel lots of drops in other things. Teen pregnancy is down. Youth delinquency is down. Violent crime is down. Serious substance abuse is down. Uh, other things. I don't know if I can mention things like this in Georgia or not. In Oklahoma, it was always a little, a, a little, a little dicey. Condom use is up. <laughs> <clears throat> including among teens. And this cuts across lots of, you know, lots of demographic and racial and ethnic groups. Uh, so, you, you know, it's in many ways, the decline in physical and sexual abuse is part and parcel of some larger societal trends that, that we've been enjoying for 20 years. And, and, and you know, um, people would say, well, that's not what you hear when you turn on the news. And, and, and you know, I guess I'd say, you know, maybe the fact that you know, we hear about things like physical and sexual abuse. Now, maybe that's part of why we're enjoying a decline, because it is much more public and much more um, um, open to discussion now than it was 25 years ago. Or, you know, maybe the fact that it's become increasingly rare is part of what makes it news. You know, things that happen all the time aren't news, although it's still pretty, pretty prevalent. But Certainly things have changed in terms of our openness about the topic. You know, I, I remember, Sandra, you, you remember like 30 years ago, we all talked about how, you know, we had to raise the veil of silence so that people, you know, because all of these things were taboo and no one talked about them, we had to raise consciousness, you know, and, and that's no longer true. I mean, anyone who watches Oprah knows that there is, there are these realities. Anyone who picks up a newspaper knows that partner violence is a reality, even among NFL football players. Who could guess? So we're much more open as a society now about many of these kinds of problems, and we've been enjoying tremendous uh, um, benefits. Now, why those have occurred is not entirely clear. Uh, there's a lot of reasons people offer, but and I'm not going to get into those. So. In some ways, this is a relatively good time for us as a field. It may mean, it may challenge us in some ways that we have to change our advocacy narratives. You know, we can no longer say things are horrible and they're getting worse by the day, so please think what we do is important. You know, our advocacy narratives may need to change more in the direction of, um, we're doing some things that are working and we need to keep it up and we need to do them better. You know, this is not a hopeless field. This is a field that has seen some success. You know, and, and basically, you know, frankly, uh, you can't go on in the advocacy world forever saying things are getting worse because people will think you're not having any success, and they'll be right. <laughs> 
So in some ways we're having success and I think we need to be uh, a little more vocal in our advocacy about the success we're having. The area where we are not having much success in terms of the numbers is with child neglect. These have been relatively, the rates have been relatively stable, whereas physical and sexual abuse are down uh, probably at least 50 or 60 percent over the last 25 years. Neglect has remained persistently and tenaciously stable over this time. Now, what this means, if you, how many of you work in child welfare? Work in child welfare? What this means for the child welfare system is that it is increasingly a system that is dominated by chronic neglect cases. Uh, sexual abuse nationally, I don't know about, I, I don't know about Georgia yet. I, I'm going to get into Georgia numbers later, but, but in nationally sexual abuse accounts for maybe seven, six, seven, eight percent of all child welfare cases. Even in the heyday, it never accounted for more than 10. Physical abuse, maybe 15 to 20 percent. Neglect is pushing 80 percent of all cases in child welfare, and it's been going up year after year after year. Now, neglect is also more recurrent in nature than physical or sexual abuse. In other words, neglect cases are more likely to come back into the child welfare system multiple times over and over. Well, you put all these trends together, and what that means is that, uh, at least in the data in many states, is that the single most common child welfare case is a chronic neglect case. And by that, I mean someone who's on their fourth or fifth trip through the child welfare system for neglect. Physical abuse is more likely to recidivate as neglect. Neglect is more likely to recidivate as neglect. And cases keep coming back over and over. And, and our, our advocacy and our prevention and our intervention efforts have just begun to scratch the surface on what we need to do to help with these situations. Neglect is a tough one. Sexual abuse is a behavior. It's a limited number of behaviors. Physical abuse is actually a relatively limited number of behaviors. Neglect is often the absence of something. And it is embedded deeply in social problems and inequalities that, while I'm not going to say they're impossible to remediate, have been persistent and require a political will that we've often not shown to have. Um, so just to give you some idea, of the role of, of broad social factors in child neglect. Um, you all have heard the saying, child maltreatment cuts across all social and economic groups, right? You've all heard that. And certainly that's true, but it don't cut across equally or anywhere close. If you compare families who are at the median income in this country to families who are below the poverty line, how much more likely are families below the poverty line to come into child welfare? Would you say double, triple, 10 times? You'd be short. 44 times more likely to come into child welfare than families at the median income. 44 times more likely. If you work on the front lines in child welfare, you not only see chronic neglect, but you see families that are deeply embedded in really serious, grinding poverty and inequities. Uh, in most of the studies, um, I do a lot of clinical trials, random randomized control trials and things like that. I, I'm always amused at people who, you know, feel a little threatened by evidence-based practice, and they always say, well, those things you do at that university, they don't work with the people I work with. The cases I work with are really... So in our studies, the median family income of folks in our studies was 900 bucks a month. Now, think about l life and living on $900 a month. 35% of the parents uh, met clinical criteria for, for depression. Uh, about 50% at some point in their life, either them or their spouse, had a DSM diagnosable addiction, alcohol or drugs at some point. Um, very high probability of never finishing high school. Uh, 
These things matter when we talk about a service system increasingly characterized by child neglect. Um, a couple of years ago, a director of our child welfare system was interested in, 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 in risk. And we had, I was pleased to hear your, your DFACS director here talk about data and, and opening up avenues to merge and access data and use that in constructive ways. Because we, we were able to access um, birth certificate data. And we got the birth certificate data and linked it to child welfare data for every single first time birth in the entire state for a period of about three or four years. So it was, I don't know, it was 65, 70,000 births. We checked. Um, a pretty large number of those were first time births to young women who were under 21, the age of the birth of their first child. Um, they were unemployed. They had not finished high school, and they had no stable relationship. Of those young women, between one in four and one in five, that child ended up in the child welfare system within the next two or three years. The next largest group were young women who were in their mid-20s when they had their first child. They had finished high school, they had gone to some extent, education beyond high school, whether they had completed college or not, something beyond high school, and they were employed. And most of them had a stable relationship. What would you guess their rate of coming into child welfare was? It wasn't one in four or one in five, it was three-tenths of one percent. So when we think about increasingly child abuse and neglect, we're still, there's still realities of sexual abuse. There's still realities of physical abuse. There's still realities where, you know, things like a victim perpetrator paradigm makes a lot of sense. But the bulk of what we're talking about now in this country with child abuse and neglect, and I think what we're going to talk about in the future, is primarily chronic neglect that is rooted in ingrained disadvantage. And I think, as many of you know, disadvantage and inequality in this country is not shrinking. Overall, we're more prosperous than we've been in a long time, but that doesn't spread out uh, across all sectors of society. It's concentrated. And you can look at geo maps of child abuse, and increasingly child welfare departments are doing this. They're geo mapping where in communities the hot spots of abuse and neglect are located. And they're clearly located in, in, in concentrated areas where in many areas of a community, half of the families who live there will have a contact with the child welfare system at some point in raising their children. So this may have some implications for how we think about prevention and how we think about uh, intervention in child abuse and neglect. So in some ways, our news is very good, but in many ways, we have really more complex and difficult problems to tackle now than I think we ever have. The good news is um, science is on your side in ways that it probably has not been for at least several decades. Um, any of you ever in the Navy? No Navy vets here? Um, if you had been in the Navy, um, let's say 250 or 300 years ago, uh, <coughs> like I was, Sandra, um, if you'd been in the Navy 250, 300 years ago, um, the scourge of the seven seas was not combat or piracy or anything. It was scurvy. Um, sailing vessels and navies lost more sailors to scurvy than they did to combat or violence or other diseases. It was not uncommon for a ship to leave and upon its return to have lost half or three quarters of its crew dead to scurvy. It was really the scourge of the seven seas. And people worried a lot about what to do. There were a lot of things that folks thought to do and tried to do about scurvy. Well, in about, I guess in the middle of the 18th century, around 1750, 
there was a Scottish physician who did something which at that time, I don't, he didn't even know he was doing it. He did one of the first randomized control trials that was ever done in medicine. He randomly assigned a small number of men with scurvy uh, to get a number of different treatments, one of which just happened to be fresh citrus fruit. Well, you guys know the story because you know the connection, right? Uh, the guys who were given fresh citrus fruit got remarkably better and got remarkably better quicker. The rest of them continued, their disease continued to progress. He repeated this, random, he replicated this trial a second time, got similar results. There was an English nobleman, a very powerful man at the time, who also repeated the study, got the same results, and began to advocate for um, the deployment of fresh citrus fruits on ships in the British Navy. So, of course, that began to happen, right? No, of course it didn't. No, of course it didn't. What happened instead? Well, what happened instead was, first there was someone who said, you know, there were several established physicians in the Royal Academy of the day who essentially had their own favorite cures that they had developed locally themselves, uh, one of which was a mixture of different balsamic vinegars, uh, oils, and herbs. I saw some of you pouring this cure on your salad before lunch. <laughs> And they persisted with this. There were others that said, well, you know, it's too difficult to change what we've always done. So let's just boil these limes down and make a syrup out of them. Well, you know, this was 300 years before people discovered vitamin C and identified vitamin I mean, people didn't know what vitamin C was, but, you know, heat destroys it. So when you boil it down to a syrup, it loses its potency against scurvy. So people tried making tinctures, they tried boiling it down. In other words, it was reasonably well proven how you get better outcomes. But, no, but implementing it and taking it up to scale took until the middle of the 20th century to happen when all ships in the British Navy and subsequently other navies began to carry fresh citrus fruit and later vitamin C supplements. There ain't no more scurvy. Um, so the moral of the story is often there's a big gap between what science can offer. Science is on your side, but there's a big gap between what science has to offer and getting it in the hands of people and getting it used and getting the outcomes that really benefit people. And I think this really is the challenge of our times. To give you some idea of where we are, um, we have replicated randomized trials of newer evidence-based parenting programs. You know, 14, 16 session parent skill programs, nothing fancy, this is not a big, this is not a big deal. It's not hard to train people how to do it. We have replicated randomized trials that show that they can reduce recidivism back into child welfare from in excess of 50% to under 20%. That's a big effect. Think about 50% recidivism and 20% recidivism. That's a big reduction. We have in existence, on the shelf, ready to go, technologies that can accomplish this. Getting them out into the field is what is difficult. And that is really the challenge of our time, is in many ways implementation, dissemination, scale up, and sustainability of these kinds of services. Um, I'll give you a personal story of failure and go with this. Uh, we were involved uh, in an initial dissemination, I guess this was about 10 or 15 years ago, of one of these parenting models. Um, highly effective, highly effective for child behavior problems, highly effective for reducing recidivism, child abuse and neglect. Uh, also improves maternal depression, although it doesn't really um, directly target that. I, you know, I, I guess when you feel better about your parenting, you tend to be less depressed. But we trained 106 providers at a variety of uh, uh, tribal service centers, and uh, trained 106 of them, 
and came back about a year later and wanted to track the, uh, essentially the uptake of these services and the delivery of them and find how many cases were actually successfully treated to completion with this new service model. Out of 106 providers at a large number of agencies that were trained, those 106 providers had seen a grand total of six cases with this new model. This is not, by the way, this was a personal story of implementation. This is how we learned, by the way, the old slogan that training does not equal implementation. <clears throat> there were people out there who could have told us this, but we didn't know who they were. <laughs> and other people have had similar experiences. I've talked to people here in Georgia who've had experiences similar to this. So the challenge we have is how to build our service systems in a way that we can take up these more effective models, get them into the hands of people who can use them, and more importantly, get those services utilized, get funding systems built that actually will support a lot of these kinds of services, uh, get referral networks built that will allow them to happen, make them accessible, make them consumable, make them things that people are able to actually use and actually benefit them. This, by the way, is part of my interest in joining a Department of Public Health at a place like Georgia State. Uh, public health is all about population level impact for services. Uh, psychology, which is kind of my background, is about effect size. In psychology, we look at how can I have the biggest effect on this one case? In other words, how can I have the biggest effect on those six cases that the 106 therapists go? Public health is about how can we essentially raise the tide for everybody in a community and have impact at a population level. One of the principles of this is often that reach Trump's effect size. In other words, how many people you can get something to may be more important than how potent what you get is. Um, classic example, now I'm sure none of you smoke cigarettes, but there are probably a few of you who, like me, decades ago, you used to. And, you know, you probably remember seeing in those little packs of cigarettes, there's this warning on the sides, something about the Surgeon General, said something about this crap will kill you. <laughs> <clears throat> and I remember looking at those when they came out, and I said, you know, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Nobody is going to make a major life change decision based on some little government blurb that they r read on the side of a cigarette pack. That's not going to have, you know, that's going to have nothing but a tiny impact on anybody. And that totally misses the point. The point is not that that has a huge impact on people. The point is, how many people read that? Well, the answer is millions and millions and millions of people read that. That's reach. And we've begun to look in child abuse prevention and intervention at different approaches that have higher levels of reach involved with them. Now, some people here are talking about social media and messaging and other kind of things, and you're already on board with this. So, um, but some examples of some things that can have high reach. A couple of years ago in South Carolina, there was a group that did a trial uh, where the message they were looking at was basic parenting information, basically basic child behavior management information. And they randomly assigned some counties in South Carolina to get the intervention and other counties did not remain the control condition. And the information was put out in the media. It was provided through pediatric primary care offices uh, for families that were identified as having really significant problems uh, with parenting their children. There were intervention programs or based in communities. They might have been based in churches or communities community centers or other kinds of places like this where they could get parenting information and get direct coaching on their parenting. And then for the highest risk families, there were much more intensive kind of things. But it was all the same parenting content. 
Same parenting messages, whether you read it in the newspaper, got it through your primary care physician, got it in a general sort of parenting promotion program or in a high intensity program for higher risk parents. It was all the same messages throughout the community and they saw population level drops in child abuse and neglect in these communities. Now they're in the process, I think, of trying to replicate. CDC's been behind this, and they're in the process of trying to replicate this, and we'll see if it replicates and how well it replicates. But these are the kind of things that I think we can begin to look at as having population level impacts on physical abuse and neglect. Um, where do we go from here to begin to use some of the information we have uh, and, and what are some of the general principles that maybe we've learned about how to get these things spread out and what works and what doesn't work? And, and so I'm just going to kind of give you my own synthesis of, of looking across this literature for the past several years. Um, we have a number of models that are reasonably effective. In fact, uh, when I first got involved in this, I guess it was back in the late 1990s, the Office for Victims of Crime convened a panel that would identify evidence-based treatments uh, that in some way or another served families affected by child abuse and neglect. You know how many we were able to identify that had even one or two controlled trials testing their effectiveness? One. Now, I'm involved in some other panels that do this, uh, last time I looked, the number was about 15, and it's climbing regularly. So there's really a fairly large body of models out there, and we can begin to look across them and maybe ask questions. You know, what do they have in common? So I'm going to try to tell you what I think some of the more effective models that are coming out these days have in common. Um, one is that they don't always match up with things that we've always believed about services including prevention or intervention services. Um, if you read, for example, the Child and Family Services Review documents or any of the documents that come out of the federal government and child welfare, you know one of the words you see most often in those documents? Comprehensive. Services must be comprehensive. By golly, if a family has 30 problems, they need 30 services. A, a program for every problem. Yet, most of the services that are performing the best in the research literature ain't like that. In fact, they tend to be much more focused than comprehensive. They don't try to fix everything, but what they do address, they address with greater depth and intensity. Focus, depth, and intensity, not breadth and comprehensiveness, seems to be what's paying off in a lot of the intervention models these days. What goes with this is actually, this is something that's, that's you know, I'm going to prepare you. It's going to scare you. You're not going to like it because if it's wrong, it could be really bad. But often, less is more. Years and years of social services, multiple programs. We're going to send this family to family counseling and individual therapy for all the parents and drug and alcohol counseling and a parenting program and a home visiting program. And, and, you know, often what we see in some of the literature is that the more of that you do, the more the benefit actually begins to erode. It's not that you get diminishing returns, it's that you poison the well. That sometimes there is such a thing, you know, this is like an al uh, allegory to uh, psychopharmacology. You know, taking eight different psychiatric medications is not necessarily a formula for success. It's not that more is not always better. Uh, sometimes fewer is better. Families get less overwhelmed. They're able to concentrate on things. You're able to set priorities. Uh, and, and maybe you take one step at a time, but that's better than trying, that's easier than trying to fix every single thing at once. And this is also true with dose. Some of the more effective interventions that we're seeing are relatively brief. We're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 14, 16, 18 visits or sessions. And this is very different than I think what we've typically thought in what was coming out in the 1980s and so, which was, you know, these two-year, three-year, five-year programs and other kinds of things like that. Currently, we're seeing fairly good results with far more concise programs, whether they're home-based. Uh, for example, Safe Care, which is based here at Georgia State, is a very concise home visiting program. Um, 
Uh, some of the parenting interventions are relatively concise. So often less is more in terms of focus and, and intensity and, and brevity rather than long, long, long-term types of services. Now, if this is wrong, boy, it would be really bad <laughs> to base your practice on this if this turns out to be wrong. But if it's true, and currently, this is a persistent pattern in the outcome literature. It's been replicated in what, three meta-analyses, which are big combined trials that combine all the other studies together. After three meta-analyses showing this with parenting, it's beginning to look like a robust finding. If it's true, this is really good news for us in the service system because what this means is that we can serve a lot more people, we can get a lot more reach out of what we do than we have been in the past. The other lesson we've learned is that quality matters in services. Quality control matters. Model fidelity matters. Um, and this has all kinds of implications and raises all kinds of difficulties for implementation. Uh, for example, our traditional way of funding our services is that we pay on a unit rate, and the unit rate is usually about enough to keep the agencies from starving to death. This incentivizes agencies to produce a greater volume of services for one client, and it de-incentivizes de putting resources into fidelity, quality control, and quality management. So often what we're seeing with evidence-based services is they cost a lot more for each contact but you use fewer contacts, and you put more resources into quality control. And in the end, it's ultimately less expensive than our traditional services. But this requires, I mean, what many of you who are managers have probably figured out long ago is that this requires realigning reimbursement systems, contracting systems, other kinds of things like that. And trying to re-engineer some of these things is a little bit like trying to steer the Exxon Valdez. These things do not make quick turns and they don't change quickly. Uh, and people are extraordinarily conservative about changing procedures when there are millions and millions of dollars at stake in doing that. So these are hard changes to make, far harder than training a provider in how to do an evidence-based model. So in many ways, our challenge these days for implementation, scale up, and sustainment of, of these more effective practices is managerial and systemic and political as much as it is technical. Um, one final aspect of this is that in child abuse services and child abuse prevention in particular, um, in order to achieve broader reach, particularly with a lot of the home-based services, I'm involved in a, a, a HRSA's Home Visiting Research Network where we've been involved in setting research agendas for home visiting services and trying to figure out where research is going to go from here. And, and, and one of the areas we've spent some time talking about is managerial with these services. Um, in this, my former home state, not this one, uh, in my former home state, uh, the state has done an exceptional job at bringing in evidence-based prevention services and scaling them up statewide. The problem has been in the delivery. So for example, if you have a nurse home visitor, and if you look at a budget, a nurse home visitor, by the time you include overhead and fringe and everything else, a nurse home visitor is going to cost your county or your state about $100,000 a year. The time you figure everything out, put everything in, it's going to cost about $100,000 a year. Uh, a lot of these home visitors, working very hard, um, very dedicated, manage to see six, seven clients a week. If I'm a state legislature, if I'm a state legislator, uh, I don't want to pay $100,000 for seven home visits a week, uh, especially when I know that a hospice nurse 
or a home-based physical therapist or someone else like that sees about 25 contacts a week. So one of the things I think that's a challenge for us in, in our business is to figure out, in some ways, managerial, logistic, and organizational structures that allow us to increase our volume and increase our reach with some of these kinds of services and get us up so that you know, we, we no longer say, well, you know, seven or eight home visits, 10 home visits a week is our target for a really good home visitor. And we quit blaming our clients for this. Well, you know, our clients, they have, you know, they're really, their lives are chaotic and they have such a hard time and, and we have a lot of failed visits and other kind of things like that. You know, I sometimes wonder wh what would happen if we brought in a logistics manager from Fed FedEx, who, when you think about it, they also make home visits. Um, <laughs> if we brought someone in from FedEx and said, you know, help us solve this problem. Um, we get about eight successful home visits a week and about half of our home visits. I, you know, I'll bet they would have some ideas. So in some ways, this is our other challenge for where we go, is, is being able to increase the efficiency so we can increase our reach. Um, so it, kind of in closing that, you know, I've, told my wife I was going to talk to a group of people from Georgia today, and she said, well, you know, there's, you know, there's certain obligatory things that every transplant in a new state has to talk about. And, and, I, and I, so we began to consider, you know, what are the obligatory things a new transplant to Georgia has to talk about? And, you know, I could obviously talk about the humidity, but you all already know about that. Um, I, I could ask for an explanation for why it is that really such a nice, polite and well-mannered group of people, once you put them on a freeway, behave like they're playing <laughs> a Mortal Kombat video game. <laughs> but in my short time here, I've come, I've come to appreciate a couple of other things. And, and, and one of them is I, I went a couple of weekends ago, uh, I went on a bicycle ride close to a little town called, I guess called Fairburn, southwest of here. And uh, uh, I discovered, uh, to my surprise, that Georgia has hills. <laughs> and you know, Oklahoma's flat. And 60 miles in Oklahoma is pretty easy ride. 60 miles through the hills on a bicycle um, but we got to the end of the we got to the end of the ride, and people had laid out this very, very, very nice spread of of food and everything like that. And and this poor woman, this woman looked at me, and I must have looked like I was about three quarters dead. And she said, "Oh, honey, what would you like to drink?" And I, and I said, "Well, I'd like some tea," <laughs> which I did not qualify. And, and, and so, and she handed me this glass that sort of tasted like it was the tea concentrate syrup <laughs> in it. But what I found is that, you know, when you're really tired and you've really been sweating a lot, there really is nothing that replenishes you like, like a good glass of sweet tea. <laughs> so I'm, I am pleased to be in a place that has glasses of sweet tea in Georgia. And I look forward to working with all of you all in, in, in the future. And uh, I'm excited about what you're doing here. So thank you for inviting me. I just wanted to thank Dr. Chaffin for um, coming out here to deepen our knowledge and with your experience so we can helpfully go out and serve our community better. So thank you.